David, and uh, good evening again, brethren. I'm going to take you back to, very briefly, to that uh, section of 1 Timothy that we considered the other day. I don't know when it was, I've forgotten, it's just, uh, it's been one after the other, but I'm going to take you to 1 Timothy 4, 12 to 16 again. Very appropriate, of course, for this group, because Timothy was around about 40 years of age, and many of you are under that age here. So it's very appropriate, these words of the Apostle to Timothy. He said in verse 12, Let no man despise thy youth. The word despise there, cataphronio, and phronio, of course, has to do with the heart. Cataphronio means to disdain or think little or nothing of with the mind, as it were. So, I mean, people will not think highly of you if in your setting forth of the Word of God, and that's what Paul's calling upon Timothy to do here, if it's quite evident that you haven't put the time uh, and the effort in, they, they, will th- they will think a lot more highly of you and listen to you if it's evident that you've put the effort in. But don't give them a reason to despise you or to think uh, nothing of you. But he goes on to say, but be thou an example. So it's no good just talking, you've got to actually live it as well. It's got to be a, a concomitant way of life that matches what comes out of your mouth. That's not always as easy as as it might seem. Be then an example of the believers, and that word example, chupos, means a die as struck. You know, to make a mark or a stamp in something by hitting it. So it's a deep impression. Be an example uh, of the believers. In word, so what you say, in conversation, the word in the Greek means manner of life or conduct, meditate upon these things. Now the word meditate upon there in the, in the Greek Meliteo means to care for or attend to carefully. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them, or as Waymouth puts it, and be absorbed in them. To be fully in them. That's Paul's counsel to Timothy, that thy profiting may appear to all. Profiting here, the word in the Greek means progress or advancement. So I don't think there's any better counsel for a group of young brethren uh, of of this uh, age group than than what Paul gave to Timothy and that's what we want to take from this weekend don't we 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 want to take the enthusiasm to go home and to continue our studies and to to dig even deeper into the word as time allows and of course there's a lot of other things that enter in in life aren't there but as time allows and you have to actually organise your time and manage your time to do that we're going to go home and we're going to do a little better try and do better than what we might have done before and to make sure that we play our part in the upholding of the truth because we do need to to contend earnestly for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. And that's why I'm going to take you now to the epistle of Jude. And we're going to focus on just one verse, just one verse, which normally when we do it at Bible schools, did it in Chippersburg recently, takes us a whole session to do. So you'll see why when we get there. I want you to come to Jude verse 9. Now, probably it's the most obscure verse in the whole epistle, Jude verse 9. And normally when this verse is discussed, it's discussed as the, well, who's the devil and who's the body of Moses and all that kind of thing, which really, at the end of the day, is not what this is about. We need to know what those things mean. But usually that kind of discussion means that you don't get to the essence of what Jude verse 9 is about. So Jude, having made reference to a certain class of people who had entered the brotherhood in the first century, fulfilling what Peter said was going to happen, that they would enter in and begin to corrupt the way, because they were not properly converted people. Certain men crept in unawares, he calls them in verse 4. I'm not going to go into any of that, that's another part of the subject. But having set them forth and identified them, he now wants to talk about how you deal with that issue, that problem of people who are not properly converted and who are, in fact, undermining the truth both by word and by practice. How do you contend earnestly for the faith once delivered to the saints? What kind of attitude do you have to have? And, well, why is it important anyway? That's all answered in verse 9 of Jude. We want to have a look at that, Okay. Now, we've read verse 9 before. Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, 
he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuked thee. Familiar passage, isn't it? The term yet here, as you can see, whereas it means in the Greek, Rotherham says but, Waymouth and Interlinear Bible are similar. So yet, this is sort of like Judas saying, now I'm going to present to you the classic example. Now what Jude does in this epistle, by the way, it's like a court case. He's the Crown Prosecutor. Uh, the, the, uh, the accused, of course, of the certain men crept in unawares and he brings out a whole range of witnesses. And he's already brought out a few of these in verses 5 to 7. Okay? A whole range of witnesses. He's going to bring more out later on. Cain and, and Korah and others. And he's going to bring out Lamech even and Enoch. But his star witness in this trial is Michael the Archangel. Michael the Archangel is his star witness. And we're going to see because Michael's example and the way he gets involved in the contention that was going on is there for you and me to follow. Now Michael, of course, the archangel, has now been, as it were, replaced by the Lord Jesus Christ. He's taken over the role of Michael as the head of the angels. So this is very close to us. This is the kind of behaviour that our Lord Jesus Christ would want us to follow when it comes to contending uh, for the faith. So who is this Michael? Well, his name means who is like Al, but there's no... There's no question mark, Hutton. This is not a question. This is a statement. This is the one who is like Ale. Now, we know that he's called the angel of the presence in Isaiah 63, verse 9. And that's why when you go back to places like Exodus 23, God says of this angel, Michael, he says, Do not vex him, for my name is in him. He will not pardon your transgressions. In other words, he had the power, the delegated authority, to forgive or condemn sin. And there's only been three beings in the universe that have had that right. That's Yahweh himself, Michael the Archangel, and the Lord Jesus Christ. So he is the personal representative of Yahweh. When he's present, God's present. That's the secret of this man, of, of this angel. And of course, he was the one who came to Joshua, Joshua chapter 5, came to Abraham, I believe, He's turned up quite a few times. He might have been with the three friends of Daniel too, Tim. He's like the, the son of man. He's called the archangel or the chief messenger, as Rotherham translates it, Israel's chief prince. And that's why this name has now been conferred upon our Lord Jesus Christ, the Michael of Daniel 12, verse 1, who will come to raise the dead. Type and forerunner of Christ. Very, very important in the scheme of things. Now, I'm not going to go through all of those details again because we've just mentioned some of those. But this, if you wanted to go back and look at that, there's the detail uh, on Michael. So what was he responsible for? Well, Daniel 10. Let's just come back to Daniel 10. Now, here in Daniel 10 we're going to read that Michael was actually ultimately responsible for the issue of the decree of Cyrus. Now this has a connection, of course, with what we were talking about in Revelation 16. It has a connection with what we're going to be seeing in the video tonight because the decree of Cyrus came on the back of the overthrow of Babylon and the return of the Jews through that decree. Who won the decree of of Cyrus for the Jews? Well, it was Michael. And we read this in Daniel chapter 10, verses 12 to 14. Now, by the way, here in Daniel 10, and we'll come to these words, uh, we read uh, verse 12, says there, Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. Now, there's two ways of interpreting what we've just read. You can interpret that as saying that Daniel from a very young man, from the first time that as a teenager, perhaps, he turned his heart to chasten himself before God, his words were heard. It doesn't mean that. This is a reference back to verse 1, verse 1 and 2. So come back to to Daniel 10 verses 1 and 2. And there's another little point that probably needs to be made here. It says in verse 1, in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia. Now what's wrong with that? Well, what's wrong with that is in chapter 1 and verse 21, we're told that Daniel died in the first year of Cyrus, 
Okay? So is this one of those problems? No, it's not. You see, when Babylon was taken by Cyrus, he was the king. But he was going to go on and conquer more countries, so he went off. And he left behind Darius the Mede, one of his relations. Darius the Mede became king, and he ruled for two years. And then he died, and so Cyrus came back and took over the role again. So you see, that's what it means here by the third year of Cyrus. He was effectively king for, for the time that Darius was on the throne, but he was away uh, in conflict with other nations. So it's not, there's not a discrepancy. It's telling it. This is actually, the third year here is actually the first year of Cyrus's sole reign after the death of Darius. Okay? Then he goes on to say in verse 2, having seen, having been given the... the Prophecy of the 70 weeks in chapter 9. Daniel, of course, is desirous of understanding what that prophecy was about. And so we read in verse 2, In those days I, Daniel, was mourning three, four weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, neither flesh came into my mouth, nor wine, neither did I anoint myself at all, till three whole weeks were fulfilled. Now that's the reference that's made here in verse 12. From the first day that thou didst chasten thyself is a reference back to the beginning of that three week period of chastening. Or why didn't the angel come earlier? Well let's read on. Read on into verse 13 of Daniel chapter 10. The angel says to Daniel that the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. So there's your twenty one days. See? The prince of Persia, namely Cyrus, withstood me. Now, what was happening here is that God wanted Cyrus to write the decree of Cyrus, but he had other ideas, evidently. So the angel had to contend with him, and you can pick this up, actually, because, you see, both here and elsewhere, you read about the angel having to fight with the king of Persia. So it's not about, you know, saying, Look, listen, we know you're going to write a decree, just write it, please. He had to actually fight with him. And that, what that means, of course, is that the angel had to manipulate circumstance. He didn't come along and punch Cyrus in the nose and say, you're right at a creek. He had to actually get hold of his circumstances and push him the way he wanted him. It took him three weeks to do it. He's absolutely flat out doing that. He can't go to Daniel. See, that's what he's saying to him. He had to wait, mate. You've got to wait. But look at verse 13. It says, But lo, Michael... One of the chief princes came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. And now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days, for yet the vision is for many days. Now he's telling Daniel that at the end of the day, he couldn't do it. He had to call upon a more powerful angel to get the decree of Cyrus, and that was Michael. So Michael the archangel was the one who accrued or acquired for the Jews the decree of Cyrus. Yahweh stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, we read in 2 Chronicles 36, 22, and in the next chapter, Ezra chapter 1, verse 1. We read in Daniel 10, 13 and 20 that the angel had to fight with Cyrus. And of course the Jews, when they got that decree, went back to the land. And they arrived in the seventh month of 536 B.C., uh, it was in the first month we read, didn't we? We didn't read it actually, verse 4. The first month that the angel began his work. So it took about six months for them to get the decree and to get back to the land and to start the building. And that decree formed the basis of the case that was made by Zerubbabel and Joshua against the Samaritans. So I want you to come back to Ezra chapter 3. Ezra 3. Sorry, Ezra 4 and verse 3. So in Ezra 4, verse 1, we read, And when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the children of the captivity built the temple unto Yahweh God of Israel, then they came to Zerubbabel and to the chief of the fathers and said unto them, Let us build with you, for we seek your God as ye do. Rubbish. And we do sacrifice unto him since the days of Esarhaddon, king of Assyria, which brought us up hither. But Zerubbabel and Joshua and the rest of the chief of the fathers of Israel said unto them, Ye have nothing to do with us, 
to build an house unto our God, but we ourselves together will build unto Yahweh God of Israel as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, hath commanded us. So what they do is they hold forth the decree of Cyrus and say, this was won for us by Michael the Archangel and it's effectively the word of God. Now keep that in mind. This is what we're going by. This is effectively the word of God. It was won by Michael the Archangel. Now the scene that we've just read about there, brethren, is the scene that Jude's talking about in Jude verse 9. Alright? That's what he's talking about. We've got to come back to that. So let's come back to the epistle of Jude because he goes on to say that this scene, as it plays itself out, Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, this word contending means to separate the evidence, to weigh the evidence, to make a decision or judgment, refers us back to Ezra chapter 4 and 5. The devil here, the diabolos, is the false accuser and the slanderer. And that, of course, is a reference to the Samaritan opposition who were in collusion, by the way, with some disaffected priests whose genealogy couldn't be found in the record of Ezra chapter 2. This is 61 and 63. And they were like a fifth column. And they, they were in, cahoot, in, in cahoots with the Samaritans to undermine the work of building the house of God. And, of course, the picture I'm trying to create to you is what Jude's trying to create, and that is that there were problems in Israel in those days, just like there were problems in the Ecclesia in the days of Jude, just like there are problems in our brotherhood today. Okay? So this is a message for all time. This is how you contend for the faith. And this is why you must contend for the faith. So it's a very, very important little uh, uh, package when you look at it. Well... He disputed about the body of Moses. The word disputed here means to speak to and fro, to dispute, etc. So this refers to the discussion between Jews, Samaritans and Persians which Michael overshadowed as the eye of God in Ezra 5 verse 5. And it's very important that we understand one thing. That while Michael is deeply involved in this, as we're going to see in a moment, nobody hears his voice. Nobody hears his voice. It's a very important point in this. The dispute was about what's called the body of Moses. Now, this is not the body that nobody knows where it's buried, is it? This is like the body of Christ. The word body there means body, living or dead. Now, Israel is called the ecclesia in the wilderness. In Acts 7 verse 38. They were the ecclesia in the wilderness. And they were baptised, says Paul in 1 Corinthians 10 verses 1 and 2. Not into, but unto Moses. So you see, Israel is a little bit like us. We have been baptised into Christ and we have become the body of Christ. Well Israel was the body of Moses in the same sense. So here we've got all the characters that are playing a part in this scene. It says that Michael durst not, he did not dare to bring against the Samaritans a railing accusation. Now there are two Greek words, blasphemia crisis, literally a blasphemous judgment. But that's not the way the Samaritans treated the Jews, is it? Because guess what happened when they were repudiated? Well, they wrote letters to the Persian king. And they made a whole series of slanderous statements about them. They won't pay tax. This is the rebellious city. You don't deal with this mob, you'll have trouble. And all sorts of railing accusations were made by the Samaritans. Michael made none. And there's a point being made here, isn't there? I don't know about you, probably you've been involved in a few disputes in your life and the truth... I've been involved in quite a few and I've been involved in pretty savage ones. It's very, very difficult not to act like a human being when you're in dispute. Because human beings will make accusations, make statements about other people, undermine their reputations, 
All sorts of railing accusations are made. I've been the object of those. And at times, I too have capitulated to the human way. And all of us have got that problem. And the point being made here is there is a way to contend for the faith. That's the issue. There is a way to contend for the faith. You can be strong and dogmatic, but there's a way of doing it. Right? They were very dogmatic. You have nothing to do with us. Now, that's pretty dogmatic, isn't it? But there's a way of doing it. No false accusations. All right? No libelous charges. Michael was not guilty of that, and neither were Zerubbabel and Joshua and their companions. But said, the Lord rebuked thee. Now this is actually cited from the other account of this. And this is the fascinating part about this, is that we don't just have the one record of Ezra 4 and 5. We've got Zechariah 3. And Zechariah 3 is brilliant because, you see, it actually tells us what was really going on. You don't read these things in, in Ezra 4. You don't read anything about Michael the archangel in Ezra 4 and 5. But you do in Zechariah 3. So in a minute we're going to go back and have a look at that. See, the principle here is, Yahweh says to me belong vengeance and recompense. Yes, so they put the matter in God's hands. So come back to Zechariah 3. Here's the story from the divine perspective. Verse 1. And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of Yahweh and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. Now this is the same story as we read back in Ezra 4, isn't it? So you've got Joshua the high priest and the Samaritans are before him and there, you know, there's a contention going on. But the, what we're not told in Ezra, we are told here. Unseen by these participants was Michael the archangel, but he wasn't alone. He had other angels with him. So we read on in verse 2. And Yahweh said unto Satan, Yahweh rebuked thee. So it's Michael who says these words. Yahweh rebuked thee, O Satan. Even Yahweh that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuked thee. And pointing to Joshua, he says, Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy or soiled garments and we know this is a type and I'm not going to go into the type that's not the, the issue here. He, was, he had soiled garments because he'd been out working building the temple that day. All right? That's why his garments were soiled. I don't know about you but I'm, I'm constantly rubbing dust off my trousers and legs here in this camp. Is that what, what's happening to you too? Unless you're wearing white pants or whatever. You get soiled, don't you, getting involved in things. That's what was happening here. Now, the vocal Samaritan opposition to the work was there for all to see, but what couldn't be seen was Michael and his companion angels. They were unseen. Look at verse 4. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him. So Michael now is instructing the other angels that are with him. Take away the filthy or the soiled garments from him and give him a change of raiment. And then verse end of verse 5, the last sentence of verse 5 says, And the angel of Yahweh stood by. That's Michael. So the, the, the lesser angels are doing the work. Michael is giving the instructions. I think we're all, we, all, we all know this picture. But here is the point, brethren. Yahweh rebukes the Samaritans through Michael but he's not seen or heard. So how can you be rebuked if you don't hear the words he speaks and you don't see him? How can you be rebuked? Well, that's the point that Jude is trying to make. So stay with me, lock yourself in, and we'll see what's happening here. This is very, very important as to how to contend for the faith. So let's come back to Jude. We got the picture from Ezra 4. We've got the picture from Zechariah chapter 3. We come back to Jude and we find that what we have here is a divine tribunal. Jude is putting on trial a certain class of brethren who are likened here to the Samaritans. 
right? Because like the Samaritans, they're trying to undermine the faith. That's what the Samaritans were about. So this class that Jude has identified, this group of certain men crept in unawares, ungodly men, is likening to the Samaritans. Let's have a look at this divine tribunal. Back in Zechariah 3, 1 and 2, we've got Yahweh in the person of Michael. We're told that in Jude 9. Alright? But of course, Michael is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Daniel 12, verse 1. Michael stood apart. Michael has given way, as it were, to the Lord Jesus Christ. It won't be Michael who comes to judge us, it will be Christ. But he's called Michael your prince. Over here we have the opposition. We've got Satan, Zechariah 3, 1 and 2. We have the devil, Jude 9, that is the accuser, false accuser. We have the Samaritans in Ezra chapter 4. So this is all the same group, okay? This is the description that are used in these records. And in Jude, we have a class, certain men crept and unaware. So they're all the same class. Okay? Clear? Well, there's another group here, isn't there? There's Joshua, the high priest, Zechariah 3 verse 1. Of course, as a type of the Lord Jesus Christ in his mortality because he's there with soiled garments. That is a nature that needs changing. He needs a change of raiment. He is the representative of the body of Moses or the body of Israel or, in the case of Jude's problem, the body of Christ. Got an idea? So, if you've got the characters sorted out, then come the words, the Lord rebuked thee. But, there's a problem. Because these words come from Michael, we read. It's Michael who says these on behalf of Yahweh. Yahweh rebuked thee. But nobody hears his words. The Samaritans don't hear his words. Joshua and the company don't hear his words. So how are they rebuked? If the Samaritans are not rebuked, well then the certain men crept in unawares in Jude's day are not going to be rebuked if nobody hears the words. So how? Well, Ezra 4 verses 1 to 6 and 5 verse 1 to 5 tell us how. They held forth the decree of Cyrus. And in chapter 5, they reminded the Persian king that a decree had been issued. That was the word of God to them. It was, a, it was given to them by the intervention of Michael the archangel. In the same way the apocalypse was given to John. Given to us by John on the Isle of Patmos. Got a picture? That's how it was done. So it was only through the holding forth of the word of God by Joshua and Zerubbabel and their company earnest contention for the faith that these people were rebuked. Now can you see the point of this? The point is this. If Joshua and Zerubbabel had not held forth the word of God then the Samaritans wouldn't have been rebuked at all. Does God want them to be rebuked? Yes. The Lord rebuked me. Let me ask you a question, brethren. Do you think Christ is really happy with things going on in the Brotherhood today that shouldn't be going on? Wrong doctrine, wrong teaching, wrong practice. Do you think he's happy with that? Do you think he would turn to his father where he sees persistence in this sort of behaviour and say... Father, Yahweh, rebuke them. And of course he does. Rebuke them. How are they rebuked? You ever heard the words of God against that sort of behaviour and activity? No. Well, who does it then? Nobody, if you don't do it. Nobody gets rebuked if you don't do it. You have to wait for the judgment. That's the point. Now, I don't know about you, 
But if you understand that, that's like a sledgehammer. And that's Jude's message. If we do not hold forth the word of truth faithfully and uphold it in its purity, nobody gets rebuked. So there's an absolute necessity to contend earnestly for the faith, but there's a way of doing it. You hold forth the word. You don't make any false accusations. You don't undermine people's reputations. You don't character assassinate. Alright? None of that. That's human behaviour. That's fleshly behaviour. You do it in the right way. But you must hold forth the word of truth against those who are undermining it, in whatever way that might be. So let's just summarise it, shall we? For those of you who might still be struggling. Let's summarise it. One, Michael had procured for the body of Moses, Israel, the decree of Cyrus. Two, Joshua and Jeroboam contended against false claims of the Samaritans by upholding the decree of Cyrus. Three, this faithful contention was the way, Yahweh said. The Lord rebuked them. Four, Jude is thus saying that God's and Christ's contention against false brethren can only be done by our earnest contention for the faith once delivered to the saints. Michael's contention and Joshua's was without blasphemy, that is false claims and slander, so would the contending of faithful brethren be without slanderous judgment. This is just pretty clear, isn't it? So what, what is our responsibility? 2 Timothy 2.15. We've just had a look at it recently. Study, be diligent to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We've read 1 Timothy 4.13. We're not going to read that again. Philippians 2.16 Holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain neither laboured in vain. 2 Timothy 3.16-17 All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, reproof, for correction. Correction? Yeah. For instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect or complete, truly furnished unto good works. 2 Timothy 2.25 In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God, peradventure, it's not your work, if God, peradventure, will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. In Galatians 6.1 Brethren, if a man be overtaken in the fall, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness. See the, the spirit of this? The spirit of meekness. Considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Yeah, we've got to contend for the faith, brethren, but there is a way to do it.